I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us. I'm Scott. I'm Scott Hippica. I'm the CEO of the Michigan Israel Business Accelerator. For those of you who have not met before, the MIBA, we're the state of Michigan's lead for all international trade and partnerships between Michigan and Israel in order to drive economic prosperity and job creation uh, for the state. In partnership with the Jewish Federation of Detroit, the Council General's Office of the Midwest, and the MIPA, and the MIBA, we're proud to welcome you to today's webinar. We're joined today by two distinguished speakers. Inam Cohen is the Consul General of Israel to the Midwest. He's based in Chicago. He's a career dip diplomat with 16 years of experience in the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Before joining, or I'm sorry, before arriving in Chicago, he held the position of a senior policy advisor to the Foreign Minister Gabby Ashkenzai and, and the director of the policy department in the Ministry's Bureau. Prior to that, he served in various diplomatic capacities in the Embassy of Israel in Madrid, Berlin, and Bogota. Inam speaks English, Hebrew, Spanish, and German, and is married to Aliet with three children. Today's moderator is David Victor. David is a seasoned businessman and investor with four decades of experience. He's held the position of CEO and currently serves as the chairman of the American Education Institute, a nationally credited provider of destination-based continuing professional education. Additionally, he sits on the board of directors for Gay, for I'm sorry, for Verge IO, a hyperconvergence hyperconvergence infrastructure software company, as well as a community bank. Um, Inam, mm -hmm. over to you for perhaps some opening comments, and then David, I'll turn it over to you after that. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and good morning. I'd like to make a few remarks just to uh, frame how we uh, see the situation right now in Israel. So I want to go back to October 7th. This is the day that the terrorist organization of Hamas perpetrated the biggest terrorist attack in the history of Israel of our 75-year history. We're talking about more than 3,000 terrorists, as far as we know now, that uh, entered Israel from the Gaza Strip. They stormed more than 30 Israeli communities um, with the aim of killing civilians, as many as they can. The outcome of this morning, uh, Saturday morning, was horrendous. We're talking about more than 1,400 Israeli casualties. And if we want to think in American terms, that's equivalent to 50,000 Americans. We're talking about 15 9 in equivalent numbers on one Saturday morning in Israel. I assume some of you have been exposed to the brutalities. I'm not going to be graphic right now, but we're talking about barbarism in scale and scope that we've never seen before. Entire families slain, massacred, women raped, children, you know, executed in front of their parents, horrible things. Journalists, we're not going to share it now, but journalists that have been exposed to some of the raw videos from the day say that they have never seen such a thing before, even not ISIS in Syria and Iraq. So this is very, very dramatic. As a result of this, upper, this uh, massacre, Israel went to uh, a military operation in the Gaza Strip that is aimed at the leadership of Hamas, a terrorist organization, the aim is to eradicate the leadership and the terrorist capabilities of Hamas in the Gaza Strip to secure our border again, to bring back security to our border. And one major issue that is at stake now is also bringing back the 241 uh, hostages that Hamas kidnapped from their homes in Israel and are now held in the Gaza Strip. We're talking about 241 Israelis, Americans, and other nationalities, among them 30 babies, toddlers, and children. Um, and this is something that is a major humanitarian issue for us. As we're looking at Gaza, I also want to mention that there are other arenas in a region that uh, draw our concern. The most important one is Lebanon. Um, and that is uh, because of the Hezbollah terrorist organization, it's a designated terrorist organization in America and in Europe that is a proxy of Iran and um, is very tempted to jump into the war against Israel. Iran has invested a lot of efforts in the past years in, in training, in financing, in inspiring 
uh, some of the most uh, dangerous terrorist organizations in the Middle East, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Shiite militias in Syria and Iraq that constantly attack uh, Americans in these countries, the Houthis in Yemen, um, and of course Hamas and the Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip. So all this net of terrorist organizations uh, inspired by Iran is very much tempted to jump into the war. Uh, my hope is that they're listening very carefully, not only uh, to what Israel has to say about it, but also to President Biden and other uh, members of the American administration who warned them very strongly not to jump in and not to consider joining uh, the war. I want to say one word about the really very strong American support that we've seen in the past weeks. President Biden, as you know, in a very unprecedented way, visited Israel during the war two weeks ago. He was very, I mean, his support was really unwavering. Um, and this is something that really means a lot, both um, in terms of solidarity to many Israelis, but also in terms of the political and the military support of the Americans. There's a lot of American forces in the Eastern Mediterranean right now. And we know that um, the members of the Axis of Evil in the Middle East are looking at them, and I hope they understand possible consequences of joining the war. Uh, we also get a very, very strong support here locally in America. We see a really a uh, very exceptionally united American Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, standing with Israel, supporting Israel's right uh, to not only to defend ourselves, but to really uh, demolish uh, Hamas and its terrorist capabilities. There are also an ongoing uh, discussion with the Americans about the humanitarian support that needs to go to Gaza and about the humanitarian issue of the Israeli and American hostages in Gaza. And one last point I want to stress before we open the floor for the, for the discussion is what is happening also locally here. Because while we see a lot of uh, political support in America, and according to the polls, around 80% of the Americans stand with Israel and support Israel. We also see really a brutal explosion in anti-Semitism in America on the streets and on university campuses, uh, driven by very specific groups. This is something of great concern, and we need every member of, of you know, the American society, elected officials and uh, business leaders to speak out against it. So this is a major issue, too. Thank you. Um, you, know, you know, I think maybe for this audience, a great briefing, by the way, but for this audience, there are some even more sort of fundamental facts we should establish, particularly given your last comment about this, this almost explosion of animus, animosity from certain corners of our country, some of it based on just misguided ideological fervor, and some of it based on a profound misunderstanding of the facts. Um, so one th I'd like you to hit this real quick. Tell, tell our audience the history of Israel's relationship to Gaza, let's say starting, I guess, maybe in 2005, because there's all this talk about Israel occupying Gaza and oppression and so forth. Can you tell this audience what the actual history of Israel is in Gaza since 2005? Yes, you know what, David, with your permission, I'll just jump back just a little bit to give a broader context. Sure. Um, in the Six Days War in 1967, Israel occupied the West Bank from Jordan and the Gaza Strip from Egypt, together with the Sinai Peninsula. Ten years later, in 1978, we had our first peace agreement with an Arab country, that's Egypt, and as part of this agreement, Egypt got back the Sinai Peninsula. Israel wanted also to give back the Gaza Strip to the Egyptians, but they refused to get it. And since then, it, was, it remained under Israeli control until the year of 2005. So 18 years ago, Israel withdrew completely from the Gaza Strip. There's not one single Israeli soldier or Israeli civilian in the Gaza Strip for 18 years now. So when so-called Palestinian supporters speak about the occupation of Gaza, they're speaking maybe about something that was before 2005, but is irrelevant for the past 18 years. But what's more important is that after Israel withdrew from Gaza with the hope that they'll be able to, you know, prosper and, you know, live independently, 
what happened is that it is complicated. I'll try to simplify it. But Hamas, the terrorist organization, designated terrorist organizations here in the United States and in Europe and in other countries, Hamas took over the Gaza Strip. And in the past 18 years, they've been ruling the Gaza Strip. Um, since then, unfortunately, we had rounds of violence, you know, Hamas shooting missiles towards Israeli civilian, popula uh, civilian population in the south of the country, in, but also Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Israel responds in, 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 in order to bring back security and stability. It happens every year or two. Uh, nobody understands what's really going on. But what happened now is really unprecedented in the sense that they don't... They, didn't only send missiles towards the civilian population, but they also uh, um, invaded the country. They took over 30 Israeli communities in Israeli territory. And that is, that is, that is the big difference from uh, previous rounds. Right. So, and I, and I think it's important for the audience to know that because there's much made of Israel's blockade of Gaza, of it being open-air prison. And I think it's important for the audience to realize that the only reason that Israel was forced to blockade Gaza when Hamas took over, it's because Hamas used all the goods that it could import, not to help their civilians, but to create the infrastructure for terror tunnels, rockets, et cetera. And that Israel does did allow uh, non-dual use goods in. And by the way, uh, Hamas disallowed a good majority, a good, a good segment of those just to purposely keep their population deprived, dependent on Hamas and hateful to Israel. So now that takes us to Hamas, because there's a misunderstanding by many of who Hamas is. And I think when you describe the brutality of the attack, which I just saw a Hamas terrorist that was captured by the IDF was interrogated, he himself said it's worse than ISIS, worse than ISIS. And what you described was the good stuff. So it's a horror show, but that's not why we're talking about it. We're talking about it because it goes directly to who Hamas is. Liberation organizations don't do that stuff. They don't act in a fanatic, genocidal way. So... Hamas clearly is not a liberation organization. Maybe tell the audience who Hamas is. What is their objective? What has their objective always been? What ideology animates them? Hamas, thank you, David. Hamas is, is um, an Islamist, a radical Islamist uh, organization. They have been founded a couple of decades ago um, as part of a broader you know, group of the Islamic Brotherhood, a brotherhood in the Islamic world, but they specifically have a Palestinian uh, angle. And in their founding papers, uh, which are valid until today, they call for two things, for the destruction of the state of Israel and of, for jihad, which means for killing as many Jews as they can. And this has been their, not only their founding papers, but also not only the ideology, but also the practice uh, ever since. This is why both the United States, but also the European Union, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, basically the whole free world is, has designated Hamas as a terrorist organization. Okay, Hamas does what they do not to advance the two-state solution, not to advance the well-being of the Palestinians. Their only declared goal is to destroy Israel and to kill as many Jews as they can. These are not my words. Just three days yeah. ago. One of yeah. Hamas top officials in Lebanon gave an interview to a local TV station, and he said it. And he also said that if they have the chance, they will do what they did in October 7th over and over again. Yeah, right. And uh, by the way, um, I'm sure you know this, uh, but there was a member, a senior member of Islamic Jihad, um, which is the same ideology as Hamas, said maybe a week ago in an interview with, a, uh, with a, I can't remember, maybe the Lebanese television station, that this isn't really a war about Israel. This is a war, I'm going to quote him now, a war against Biden's West. Our objective is to remake the entirety of the Middle East. So this is an, uh, this, uh, this uh, ideology is the same one that animates ISIS and Al-Qaeda. It's no different, which is why the president has called this a, a, a inflection point in history in Amer American security, not just Israel. So again, who Hamas is, the brutality of the attacks, what this guy who you quoted said, how has that impacted Israel's strategic objective with respect to Hamas, what it feels it needs to do to, to in self-defense, and the Israeli psyche? That's a very important question. I think this interview only um, strengthens the need for what we're doing right now, and this is really to eradicate the leadership and the terrorist capabilities of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, but it also connects to 
some calls that we're hearing now from certain politicians, really, I would say right now it's, it's in the margin of American politics, calling for ceasefire. And what's ceasefire for us? Let me quote Hillary Clinton from a few days ago. What yeah. Mrs. Clinton said, that ceasefire with Hamas right now means to save Hamas, to let them rearm, let them take new positions, and let them have the opportunity to attack again Israel. So what we're saying now, if we want to save Israelis, if we want to save the Palestinians who live in the Gaza Strip, there's no ceasefire now, because we need to really make sure we eradicate both the leadership and the terrorist capabilities of Hamas in the, in the Gaza Strip. Yeah, right. Um, and um, let's talk about this too. Um, and then we'll get to things specific to sort of the business world, but it's important to have this broad understanding because much is me made of humanitarian situation, uh, in Gaza, the, the the situation of innocent civilians being killed, and they are being killed, as we know. But can you give a, the audience some insight as to why that is the case? And Israel's uh, um, uh, mandate to uh, obligation to defend itself by eliminating Hamas. Why are civilians killed in in Gaza? Yes, this is a major issue and a major concern for for us. You know. Um, I would say 10 days or two weeks before the Israeli ground operation in Gaza started, we have called on, upon all the Palestinian civilians who live in the northern part of the Gaza Strip to evacuate to safer zones in the south where uh, no, no uh, warfare is happening right now. That was uh, with the goal to uh, make a distinction, a clear distinction between the terrorists of Hamas and the civilian population. What happened in this is the following. Not only Israel is trying to uh, uh, protect Palestinian civilians, what Hamas does is that they're using them as human shields. And they, we have a lot of information and a lot of evidence about Hamas preventing the civilians in the Gaza Strip to go down south to the safer zones. They did it by putting roadblocks to prevent cars from going down. They did it by detonating at least one bridge that we know of in the Gaza Strip to prevent people to evacuate down south. They even confisc confiscated car and keys to cars to prevent people to ev from evacuating and going down. But let me tell you one more thing. What they're doing is that their major headquarters, and we have a lot of intel, and the Americans have a lot of intel about that, the major headquarters of Hamas in the Gaza Strip are not in designated military uh, bases or terrorist bases. No, they're putting them behind the major hospital in the Gaza Strip, behind the uh, Shifa hospital. We have a lot of intel, a lot of Hamas uh, uh, terrorists that were kept and investigated in Israel, admitting that. They're uh, having their uh, headquarters in residential buildings and in schools with the goal that Israeli and Western moral does not allow the killing of many civilians. They don't care about the civilians. They're using them as human shields. So what we do is that our IDF, if we need to attack um, a terrorist headquarters in Gaza Strip, we uh, let the people that are surrounding this headquarters know that we're going there, know that in 24 hours, in 10 hours, in two hours, we're going to bomb it because it's a terrorist headquarter. Please evacuate. But Hamas, in many cases, prevents from people from evacuating. And this is why we also see a lot of civil casualties, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. And, and I think contrary, it's going to be hard for this audience to grasp, but Hamas sees civilian casualties as a plus, not a negative, because then they, yes, parade the corpses, they parade the corpses in front of the international media to make Israel look like the aggressor and to gain sympathy. OK, let's go to the business environment, because this is a, a I don't even know how to describe it. It's a cataclysmic event in Israel. And we had a call up. I'll let you just de define what. 130% call up means because it'll blow these people away. I think of that that are watching right now. And then tell me how this has impacted the business environment uh, of Israel. Yes, um, that's a major issue. I would say that the Israeli market now is really dedicated to you know our success in in restoring security in our communities. We have hundreds of thousands of Israelis that have called been called to the uh, reserve service in, 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 in the army. They're deployed in the south, but also across the border with Lebanon to make sure our country and our communities are safe. It means that hundreds of thousands of Israelis are not occupying their jobs right now. 
um, that, that affects all the companies, all the markets. Um, it will have, I would say, a significant short-term effect, but my assumption, my very base assumption, is that within weeks, uh, the vast majority of them will go back. My hope is that after, and we'll see a decline in our GDP for a very short term for sure, because it really affects the market. My hope, and also looking back at you know, previous events, not only in Israel, but also in other countries, is that the economy of after the war would, would I mean, there's a lot of need to rebuild, reconstruct. You know, we have 30 communities that have been destroyed. That would generate a lot of uh, economic activity which I hope would only, you know, generate uh, growth and boost again our GDP. And I want to say one more thing. For those that are on the call and had some previous experience uh, doing business with Israel, but also to those who don't yet have experience in doing business with Israel. I think what's really special in Israel is not our production capabilities. It's especially the, uh, what's most important and what's most uh, special in Israel is, uh, I would say, the, the energy and the innovative spirit. This is what made Israel the startup nation. This is what made Israel a cutting edge, edge uh, innovative economy. And this energy and this spirit is not going anywhere. On the contrary, what we see right now in the civil society in Israel is energies that we haven't seen in many years with a lot of conviction and determination to protect our country, but also to um, make our country stronger in economic terms. So my hope is that right after day one after the war, we'll go back to as much normality as we can, and I hope to see a serious boost in our GDP again. Great, so uh, I'll, I'll answer my own question about 130% call up because you, you had a lot of information you forgot. Just so the audience knows, 130% of the reservists that were called up by the IDF showed up, meaning 30% more that were called up than were called up actually showed up at the bases. People that were not called up, 30% showed up, which is a, a stunning figure. Um, to tell us about the support in the business context that Israeli businesses are receiving from businesses across the world and, and here. Uh, yes, I would say that one of the most encouraging things for me in this very unpleasant times for every Israeli, both in the country and abroad, one of the most encouraging things was to see the unprecedented wave of support that we got from so many uh, friends, partners, business leaders, uh, community members here in the United, here in the Midwest, but all across the United States. Um, from just you know reaching out to find out about the Israeli partners, what they can do, how can they support, how can they even uh, um, you know find uh, temporary solutions for the fact that the Israeli market is not in full capacity as it should be right now. There has been amazing support, physical support, sending you know um, supplies to the community that have been affected to the more than 200,000 Israelis that have been displayed. displayed. Um, so this is something that's really encouraging. And I know that this is something that is happening now, but also serve as, you know, as a basis for the day after the war to continue the partnership between our regions. So, so last question before I turn it over to uh, Stephen Ingber, but 130% um, call up. What impact does that have on the Israeli workforce? I mean, what percentage of the workforce is now on the front lines and, and the obvious impact that has on businesses. Um, I, it, is, it is quite significant. I don't have the exact number, but I would say that this is something uh, that would be at least around 10%. This is huge. It is a lot. It is a lot. But again, please remember that, again, those who do not know in Israel might, might not understand that, but Israelis are very good in, in finding ad hoc solutions. Yeah. Finding solution on the spot for for you know unexpected uh, challenges, and what yeah. I'm hearing from many friends and also in the media is that companies have been able to find wonderful solutions to you know have their employees who are now uh, have been called to reserve service continue to do some of the missions of their companies from distance. There's a lot of innovation and wonderful energy, very positive spirit. So I would say that the effect. It's not necessarily 10 to 15%, but maybe a bit lesser than that. 
Right. For those who remember that show, MacGyver, I would say Israel is made up of a bunch of MacGyvers. Right. So, uh, OK, so let me turn the program over to uh, uh, Federation, Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Detroit's CEO, uh, Stephen Ingber. Stephen. David, thank you. Yinam, thank you. Uh, always good to see you, unfortunately, under these circumstances, both of you. So, look, there were a couple of questions, and they, I think they sort of all centered around, you know, what can we do in Michigan? What can we do as Michigan business leaders? And so I, I really break it down to sort of three core categories. I think that is, um, and it might be interesting the way I deliver it to you, but first and foremost, check on your Jewish employees. Uh, this is not just a war in Israel. I mean, a lot of what is happening is happening here in the States. There is a lot of pressure. There is a lot of anti-Semitism. There is a lot of ugliness that we are seeing over and over again in the media. And um, some of your Jewish employees are probably not okay. They may not admit it, but many are struggling. So check on them and make sure you're you're fostering a place of understanding and love and not, not allowing hate to continue. Two is the easiest one. You know, make a personal gift to our emergency campaign. We'll send out information after this. You know, corporations can make gifts, obviously. Uh, all dollars that we use are going specifically to Israel. None of them are standing here. None of them are actually helping with the war effort. They are all humanitarian dollars to help the people of Israel, basically the, the use and eyes of, of Israel. And third, and almost equally as important, make a public statement. You know, don't stand behind, oh, we're not waging into this. You know, make a statement. It can And it can call out hate however you want to do it. And we'll help you craft it. We, we've done many of these. But come out and say, we stand with right. This isn't a right and wrong issue. Uh, and I think it's important that we get support, you know, from from businesses here. And so I really, uh, first of all, coming to this, I really want to say thank you. And like, those are three really concrete. And you notice two of the three of them don't cost you anything. And I think that's what that's what oftentimes is lost is that we don't realize that there's people behind all of this. There's names behind, you know, behind this. This isn't just numbers. When we say 1400 people, there are thousands of people. There are thousands of families that have a story to tell. And it's the same thing here um, in Israel. A lot of us, we're all, or in America, we're all one step away from somebody that we know that this is affecting literally on a daily basis. Again, if anyone has any questions about how to check on your Jewish employees, how to write a statement, what they can say and what not to affect, you know, anything, we're more than willing to uh, help and certainly any financial donations. And with that, Scott, I'll turn it back over to you to close us. Thank you, Steve. And I want to thank all of our audience members for taking the time from your busy schedules and joining us today. And then I want to thank our moderator, David, and our guest speaker, and I'm Cohen. Thank you, everybody, for joining such an important topic. And I would ask that you strongly consider Steve's outreach and his efforts to support what's happening in Israel and to support our community here in Michigan. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your Friday. That concludes today's briefing.